<clears throat> now I want to say, you know, it was really great listening to Michelle Roberts uh, in the interviews of the um, our sponsor today, the Equitable and Just National Climate Platform, which is sponsoring today's conversa conversations. I've learned a lot about environmental justice from the founder of environmental justice. We have Dr. Robert Bullard, who is known to many as the founder of that whole section, the environmental justice world. He's a distinguished professor of urban planning and environmental policy at Texas Southern University. He's the author of 18 books on environmental racism and justice. He also sits on President President Biden's Environmental Justice Advisory Council. I asked him a little bit about that just a short while ago on how all that's going. Fascinating interview. He's up now, Dr. Robert Bullard. Dr. Bullard, thank you so much for joining us. Listen, I want to be candid. I think a lot of Americans who have not been victims of systemic racism don't think on the front end of this. You might understand their experience hasn't taken them there. But when we talk about climate change and we talk about um, who, who may be victims of that process. I think it's important for people to hear how race has figured so significantly into the infrastructure decisions we've, we've made in the past and how it needs to be worked into what our solutions and responses in the future. Can you help our audience understand why this is so important? Well, Steve, I think it's really important that people understand that uh, what gets built and what doesn't get built oftentimes is not really based on any objective criteria. Oftentimes, for example, discrimination in the past that occurred, say, 100 years ago with racial redlining uh, can impact what's happening today in the 2020s. When you look at uh, which communities are more likely to flood because of infrastructure is not put in place, which communities uh, don't have trees, green space, parks, green canopy, they, they are uh, actually hotter than, um, than uh, neighborhoods with trees uh, and green canopy because of, um, of uh, basically this urban heat island. And so mm -hmm. if you talk about where industrial pollution uh, is more likely to be a hot spot, and again, because of zoning, land use patterns, industrial facility siting, following the path of least resistance, it's created uh, vulnerability, and again, when you look at a racial lens in the past, those inequities and vulnerabilities uh, are pushed forward in the future. So those communities that are least able to afford and fend off um, the impacts of climate change are the very communities that, um, uh, have, that will suffer and are suffering today, first, worst, and longest. That's the racial justice, the equity lens, the health lens that really need to be applied to infrastructure and to climate policy. Now, I've read about your past and, and, and you and your wife's work in bringing some of the first lawsuits that connected uh, decisions on waste and where waste was going to, you know, the racial composition of community. And, and, and you, they, they call you the father of environmental justice. And, and I guess my question is, you know, that, as I understand, was around the, you know, 1979, 1980, you know, quite, quite a ways back. What's, what has the, um, um, I don't know how to frame this right, but what has really gone well and what has really gone badly since then? Do you feel like environmental justice is now part of the framework? I know you're an advisor on these issues to the Biden team. Are they listening to you? Do they hear you? Do you feel like you now have standing? Well, you know, in 1979, that was a long time ago. <laughs> yeah. And uh, again, you're talking 40, 41, 42 years ago. Uh, environmental justice uh, then was a footnote. Today is a headline. We made progress, but there's so much progress that needs to be made because of the communities that are, as I said before, that are on the fence on the fence line with industrial pollution and on the front line of climate change, they're still vulnerable. And they're made more vulnerable uh, because of how money's dollars, uh, tax dollars get spent. So when mm. we talk about infrastructure, in the past, infrastructure like highways and roads, freeways, in many cases, the, that infrastructure was detrimental to many communities because of highways, in many cases, was the line of demarcation between what goes on that side and what goes on, on the other side of the highway. In many cases, highways ripped through uh, black and brown communities and destroyed a stable community. So we have to be careful not to assume that all infrastructure is created equal and that mm -hmm. every community is getting their fair share of those tax dollars. That's why I think it's important when the president talks about Justice 40, uh, sending 40% of those investments or, I'm sorry, benefits toward those communities 
that historically have been left behind that are disadvantaged. That's a great start, but we have to make that initiative real and we have to make sure that um, we monitor it and have good scorecards to uh, evaluate it, to make sure that we're not just promising. Promises uh, are uh, promises are not the same thing as getting a communities um, uh, resilient and making them much more sustainable and, uh, and livable. You, know, you, you made this statement that I really appreciate because I sort of feel like I swim in these terms too. You're trying to figure out how to frame stuff. And you said there are all kinds of terms that have been used as a proxy for race, whether you know it's disadvantaged or underserved or vulnerable or marginalized. And you said, basically, when you peel back um, the onion skin of all that, we're talking about race and we need to be much more just upfront and, and basic about it. Um, and I agree with that. I've interviewed people like Anthony Fox and others you know, who were mayors and then went on to transportation and you know, taught me about how so much infrastructure has divided communities and, and, and also fallen disproportionately um, on communities where race was, was a driver. I guess the, the real thing I want to get is I feel as if where we are as a nation is a product of lots and lots and lots of decisions. And so to undo that, it's like a huge, huge tanker ship. It's probably an overused metaphor, but it's not going to be a magic wand or a quick fix anyway. And I'm interested in systemic change and how you affect systemically attitudes, orientations, money, funding to undo some of this and still meet our climate uh, needs, you know, in terms of this. And I know that's a big question, but I'd love to get your insights on how to turn the ship. Well, I think when we talk about climate change, climate change is more than parts per million in greenhouse gases. It also includes policies and frameworks that will address inequity, that will, and that will address um, uh, uh, vulnerability and disparities. And I think, so it means that bringing all the pieces together in terms of a, uh, uh, interdisciplinary work, as well as a uh, whole of government approach that the administration is talking about, so when we talk about climate and talk about solutions, we're talking about transportation, energy, housing, food and water security, energy security. When we talk about the issues around land use, planning, uh, and making sure that, that we do it right, as opposed to allowing just market forces to drive it. Market forces oftentimes uh, has driven us to this path of least resistance and uh, making sure that those with wealth and those with power can get in the front of the line. And so we have to talk about the issue of making sure that all of our uh, residents in communities across the country uh, have access to those things that make us healthy, make us resilient, and make us uh, a much more secure nation because climate change is a national security issue. And if we don't get it right, then we are not uh, doing the best, uh, operating the best interests of our nation. My understanding, Dr. Bullard, is that some of you and your colleagues have been a bit disappointed in the slowness of the Biden administration in prioritizing this. What can they do better? Well, I think, uh, I think the administration has to step it up because we don't have, I've been working on this for 40 years. We don't have 40 years. We don't have, you know, 20 years. I think the fact is that, that when we connect those dots with voting rights and, and saving our democracy, and connect those dots with when it comes to an energy transition to that clean energy economy. And we talk about health and talk about access to health care. We talk about issues of affordable housing. All these things are connected. So it means that we have to push out programs and have that interagency approach so that the right hand knows what the left hand is doing. So we're not working at cross purposes. And I think they're, they're getting it, but I think the speed of which um, the urgency of now is somewhat uh, uh, that needs to uh, step it up. And I do think that uh, there are very, there are lots of uh, smart people inside of government and there are lots of folks outside of government that are willing to work with in partnership. And I think we will get this right. We just have to move uh, with the speed of, uh, of that, uh, you know, faster than a moving <laughs> of trade and, and a bullet. Uh, that, that has to happen right now because, uh, uh, the urgency of now is right now and climate change is not something we talk about you know happening 20 years from now it's happening right now and those frontline communities those vulnerable communities they don't have a lot of time to wait especially with these um with these uh horrific storms dangerous strong storms and rain and flooding 
just happening year after year after year. We used to plan for disasters down in the Gulf Coast uh, June through November, but now we have to plan for a year round with the winter storm Uri hitting us last year, uh, this time uh, 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 with this severe storm and it's just knocked out our power. We lost power, we lost water, people were cold. That's, so it's year round. And we have to realize that uh, in terms of our planning, in terms of working with communities, especially working with these most, our most vulnerable population um, that are most at risk. Let me ask you, you know, one last question and, and I hope I get it right, but I, I know you don't only work at the federal level. You work all around the country. You work with, you know, all forms of government, different layers and levels out there. I'm always interested in knowing whether there was a place or a, you know, a, a pattern of teams or others that got this right in the right ways that other parts of the country can learn from. Are there standout experiences you've had in the last 40 years where you've achieved success and that the right, you know, alignment of stars came together that we can learn from and that other parts of the community and even the federal government can learn something from um, something that's gone well in the past on, on this front of environmental and racial justice? Well, the, the best examples that I've seen working over these many years, uh, four decades, is what I call the anatomy of success. And usually you have strong uh, participation with, with community groups and organizations and networks, working with local uh, government and, and having those partnerships, having community university partnerships where you can use the university, you know, the, you know, the smart people and the big brains and work with community-based organizations and the groups who really are closest to the problem, but they also are closer to solutions. When you find those uh, types of collaboration, you are you are getting uh, uh, on on the road to uh, successful initiatives. And when the money follow need and money follow solution oriented initiatives, I've seen a lot of work happening. And there's a lot of good work going on all across the country. Uh, and and a lot of it is uh, is uh, flying uh, uh, below the radar. It's not getting a lot of recognition. But I do think when we lift them up and show that what's working and show how it's working, other people can uh, take notice and, uh, and uh, adopt, adapt, and, and, uh, and make those uh, things that work uh, fit their needs. And, and we know we are a big country. We are a very diverse country. And I do think that there are lots of uh, good solutions that can, uh, that can make a difference uh, in, in how we uh, do our policy, how we do our planning, and how we spend our tax dollars. I really appreciate it. Dr. Robert Bullard, director of the Bullard Center for Climate and Environmental Justice. My notes here say that you've been on the front lines of environmental justice for more than 40 years. Folks, this guy created the front line of the environmental justice movement. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Bullard, and we look forward to talking to you again. My pleasure.